During the course of our study through the Psalms, we have come across several Psalms that were quite clearly Messianic Psalms, um, especially in regards to what they looked forward to and then the way they were referenced in the New Testament. When I say Messianic Psalms, I'm saying Psalms that in some form or fashion was a direct reference to Jesus, what he would suffer, and what he would go through. Now, this particular Psalm 69 has at least three statements in it that are either used in reference of Jesus, or I should say by Jesus, in reference to what he's going through at that time, or um, a statement that was fulfilled in Jesus. And so some scholars view this as a strict, strictly a messianic psalm. Others view this as a psalm that the overall message is what is seen within the life of Christ. Hence, Jesus and others pulling upon the various statements that are found therein. Part of, and the reason why I say that has to do with verse 5. The reason why some view it's not purely messianic, but it was still used by Christ and does kind of look forward to Christ in some ways. But we'll get into that, not very deeply, of course, because I want us, as always, try to catch the overall point of the psalm and how it applies and how we use it within our lives. So let's go ahead and start with Psalm 69. The first 12 verses here, we see a prayer and pro the, the prayer and problem faced by the psalmist. And we have to keep this in mind. Although it may be a messianic psalm, there, when, when we read through this, I believe the first and foremost application is by and, and to the psalmist. What was he going through? What was he facing? And it just so happens that in some of these psalms, there's that secondary, probably the original intention behind it by the Holy Spirit, which does look forward to Christ. But it, it, it basically reflects what the psalmist was going through at this point in time within his life. So let's go ahead and read the first 12 verses there. So he writes, Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for God. And then we continue on. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully. Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. O oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. Because for your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth my garment and I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate speak against me and I am the song of the drunkards. Okay, so let's go back up to verse 1 here in our reading. And we won't, like I said, we won't take a very detailed look for this, but first off, let's look at the expression of need, the, the, the full expression of need that the psalmist here has found himself in. It is interesting when you look at some of the statements that he makes here, the way that he describes it. I'm sure we have all faced times like this. We felt like that we were sinking that we were getting in over our heads. And that's kind of, I mean, look at the first two verses there. He talks about the waters have come up to my neck. And then he says, I sink and die in deep mire where there is no standing. He feels like that things are flooding over him there in verse 2. The psalmist says, I'm weary with my crying. My, my, my throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. But look what he said there in verse 4. He says, those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, for just a moment to John chapter 15. 
And we'll come back to our text, so you, you want to mark that here. But you'll notice over in John chapter 15, and note with me there in verse 25. Jesus says, and we'll back up to verse 23. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. All right, so here Jesus himself is looking back to this phrase that is used by the psalmist here and placing himself in the very predicament, if you would, that the psalmist had found himself in a place, a point in time where really he had done nothing wrong. They hated him without a cause. He says, they are mighty who would destroy me. They, you know, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. And Jesus, you think about what he's about to go through as he's in his conversation there with his apostles in John 14, 15, and 16. This is the Last Supper before the night, or, or before that night, when he's going to be arrested and put on trial. And so there are going to be many who find wrong with him when he has done nothing wrong. And ultimately, he will have to die for our sins. And notice this, though I've stolen nothing, I must still restore it, the psalmist writes. And so it would make sense that this is why Jesus would kind of pull upon that particular phrase that it might be fulfilled that those who hate me hate me without cause. But let's go back to Psalms 69 now. Let's continue there. Now notice a couple of things here when we look in the next three or four verses here. He references in verse 5, O oh God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. That's why some scholars question whether or not it's an actual messianic psalm, because it references sin in, in the part of the psalmist's life. And David, we know, um, had fallen on many occasions. David was guilty of sin. And David recognized, the psalmist here recognized, that his sins were not hidden from the Lord. Now, I guess if we were to kind of stretch it a little bit, we might say that this could apply to Jesus figuratively, not that Jesus was guilty of sin, but he was treated as if he was guilty of sin. All right, because Paul makes the point that our sins, you know, uh, when, when Jesus died upon the cross of Calvary, um, our guilt of sin was placed upon him. In, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I believe, makes a statement very similar to that. And so it could be that, he's re that the psalmist here might be referencing through the gift of the Holy Spirit the time when Christ would be put to death for, for our sins, you know, paying the price for our sins. So that's why some scholars view verse 5 as being the point that says, no, it's not a true messianic prophecy. There are just many things within here that were seen likewise in the life of Christ. We're not going to get into that very deep. But notice what verse 6, though. So he says, let not those who wait for you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel. Here he's referring back to that sin, the, the psalmist is. All right? And he's hoping that the people around him would not be brought to be ashamed because of what he had done. Let not, let not those who wait for you, O Lord of God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. And then the same thing again in verse 6. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God. God of Israel. He then says, because for your sake I have borne reproach, shame has covered my face. All right, so again, something has gone on in the life of the psalmist here. He has faced and endured a level of reproach because of his faith in God. And the way that the next verse paints the picture, and this is again why people kind of see it, it, it mirrored in the life of Christ, he says, I've become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mothers and children. I mean, think about when the psalmist, David here, at what point in his life might this have, have fit? Well, what comes to my mind is when Absalom tried to overthrow him. When Absalom ran him out of the city of Jerusalem. There was a point in time where it seemed as if his whole family had turned on him in a manner of speaking. And because of his sin with Bathsheba, 
There was the, the Lord said the sword would not depart from his family. So there was going to be much tribulation in the life of the psalmist here. And then in verse 9, he says, Because of zeal for your house, because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. The psalmist here felt like that the things that he was suffering, he suffered in part because of his great zeal for God. But notice there, your Bibles probably have a similar footnote at the first part of verse 9 that points us over to John chapter 2, there in verse 17. And in John chapter 2, there in verse 17, then his disciples, now let's look at the context surrounding that for just a moment there. This is after he has gone and he's driven the money changers out of the temple. This is Jesus. And then the apostles remembered what was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. So they recalled, recalled this particular psalm when they saw what Jesus was doing. Zeal for the house of God has eaten me up. So again, the psalmist felt like his desire to serve God, his desire to be right with God, consumed him so much that when people reproached God, he took it as if they were reproaching him. And that does kind of line up a little bit the way Jesus was as, as, all, as well. He told his apostles that when people rejected them, they really weren't rejecting them, they were rejecting Christ. And so th there's a great similarity between the psalmist and Jesus when you look at what both have gone through. Verse 10, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. And then verse 11, I also made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to them. Those who said in the gate speak against me, and I am the song of the drunkards. He viewed himself as having fallen to the lowest point he could fall. Hence illustrated, I also made sackcloth my garment. In our culture today, if I was to ask you what is it that people face that really, that whenever they face the greatest amount of shame, how does that, how's that manifested within their life? In our culture, we really don't have any set things that we do when we feel great shame. We might want to stay in and we might want to seclude ourselves. Hopefully, we'll cry and be distraught. But imagine a culture and a practice where you would sit in sackcloth and ashes, where you'd take a garment that was incredibly rough. We're, we're very tender people nowadays. You buy wool pants and they cause you to itch and stuff like that. Well, here with this sorrow, you take something that's very hard on the body, the sackcloth, and you wear it as a garment. You sit in ashes, and I became a byword to them, to these people who had rejected the psalmist who had rejected God himself, the psalmist, a representation of God, in that he worshipped God and served him, he became a byword of those people. He sat at the gates, and I'm the song of the drunkards. I'm not quite sure what he means by that. If it's the song that drunkards sing about him, you know, or people treat him as he is, it, just like, he would, like they would treat a drunkard sitting there in the gate. So we see a great plight within the life of the psalmist, as it is laid out here. And it is very interesting that in much of this we see Jesus treated in a very similar fashion. I mean, he was crucified with thieves, one on each side. You know, and, and the, the way that he was treated, he was not deserving of. And they, they spat upon him, they, they, they cursed his name, the soldiers, and everything. He kind of underwent a type of treatment that much is mimicked, or at least described here. And Psalm 69. But let's look at the next section, though. Now we have a prayer for deliverance is being renewed by the psalmist. The psalmist has not forgotten God, and as much as it might seem at times that God has forgotten the psalmist, the psalmist realizes that that is not the case. And so let's pick up reading in verse 13. We'll read down through verse 21, and then back up and, and discuss this up. So notice what he says, But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. He says, Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. 
Go back to the beginning of the psalm. Remember, he's referencing a, a lot of things he said in that description. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up. And let not the pit shut its mouth on me. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies, and do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar, vinegar to drink. So let's back up to verse 13. We'll get to 21 here in a minute. I, that light bulb went off real quick when you, when you heard that verse right there. Um, but now let's back up to verse 13. So notice as he's laying out his plea unto God, he offers a prayer unto the Heavenly Father. In the acceptable time, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. That kind of sounds like some of the prayers that we might pray under the new covenant of Christ. Lord, if it be your will, you know, in the acceptable time, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. We pray to our Heavenly Father, much like David prayed to his Heavenly Father. But here David prayed for this deep deliverance, or, or deliverance out of deepness, if you were, if you would. We saw that when we read through here. In his description of him sinking deep and getting in over his head, he's praying the Lord will not allow that to be the final state. The Lord, he references in verse 16, your loving kindness is good. Turn me according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Um, I, it's hard to imagine in the world we live in today, in our bubble of the world that we live in today, finding ourselves in this type of situation. But I guarantee you it's very possible. We, you know, we have a good where we're at in our little bubble. But it's not always that way, not in every place, not with every person. And you may have Christians in the world today who are facing situations that truly feel like they are drowning, and they, like David, are praying to the Lord to deliver them, to bring them up, to lift them up in his loving kindness and the multitude of his tender mercies. And then notice what he says here in verse 18. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. It's the idea of saving the psalmist. Now, we equate much of this terminology in the New Testament to sin, being redeemed from our bondage unto sin, delivered from our enemies. In this case in point, David was looking for actual deliverance. And David says, Lord, you, you know my reproach. You know my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. In other words, you are not unaware of what's going on. You are fully aware of everything that has taken place. You know my heart. You know it is broken. You know my heart has been heavied. You are fully aware. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, I found none. I would hate to think that someone of our number or anyone has gone through something like this, but there may be times in our lives where we truly feel that way, where we are all alone in our stance for what is right, and we are suffering as a result of it, and we want to turn to somebody. And there's no one around us for us to reach out and hold and to hug and take comfort. Jesus, when he hung upon the cross of Calvary, who was there for him? You think about it. When he hung upon the cross of Calvary, who was there for him? Yes, his, his mother and a couple of the apostles were there, but they couldn't help him. He said, Mother, talking to, to his mom, and John, he says, Mother, behold your son. And to John, he said, Son, behold your mother. They couldn't reach out and hug him. They couldn't reach out and comfort him. They couldn't say, Hey, it's going to be okay. Just hang in there, so to speak. Now, of course, Jesus knew all this, but it doesn't take away from the fact that he suffered in the physical body, and he died in the physical body. 
Just as we would, if we were hanging on a cross the way that they nailed him to the cross, if we were suspended like that, we would die too. And we would suffer and agonize as he did. They also gave me gall for my food. They brought him the vinegar, which is basically um, spoiled wine, effectively. Um, they, they gave them this to drink. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar. This is why, again, scholars believe that this is a messianic prophecy. But imagine, though, in the illustrative way, David, in talking about everything that he's gone through, your enemies have been so bad, so terrible to you, you've down at your lowest point, and you feel like you are now underwater, you're under the mire, and there's no one there to help you, and you finally reach out to someone and they give you poison for food and vinegar to drink. Can you imagine singing this psalm in worship to God? Because these psalms were used in temple worship. But the beauty of it is it's not the end. Okay? It is not the end. So let's continue. The next section, imprecation on his enemies. I would say raise your hand if you know what imprecation means. I had to look it up. Imprecation. Imprecation, in, in, in the way it's used here, is the idea of pronouncing a curse upon his enemies, basically. Um, if, if you get Alexa to define it for you, you, you may get something like a cursing of someone or something like that. But it is the idea of, of imprecating, if that helps. Probably doesn't. Um, but it's the idea of pronouncing a curse or wishing the justice to fall upon your enemies, in this case, in point. And let me illustrate this as we, as we read through here. So pick up in verse 22, and we'll read down through verse 28. So he says, Let their table become a snare before them, and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they do not see, and make their loins shake continually. What David is praying for on behalf of his enemies is the justice of God. And really, when we talk about praying for our enemies, that's what we should pray for. You know, say, so say, okay, I'm gonna pray that, you know, I'm gonna pray God will bring justice upon their shoulders. Now that is a double-edged sword, because the justness of God is perfect. Okay? So what we may deem as something, an act that deserves his vengeance and his wrath and their death, since he is the judge. He truly knows their hearts, and if they repent, then he forgives them. So the, what David is praying for his enemies here is under the scenario of them not repenting, not changing. This is them for who they are, unrepentant. And so he says, let their eyes be darkened so they do not see. Make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents, for they persecute the ones who have, who they, who, let me rephrase it. For they persecute the ones you have struck and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. And add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. So again, see that last part? He's looking for God's justice upon the people and in this case in point this is what they deserve what David's asking for is not something that is 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 unexpected because all throughout the history of the children of Israel God would always protect his people if they would follow him and if they walked away from him then they would suffer at the hands of their enemies but the enemies would still have to give an account to God for the way they treated his people. Look at the, the tribe, uh, not the tribe, the country of Edom. Edom had to pay a, a very high price because when the children of Israel had an opportunity to flee, the, the, the people of Edom prevented them from doing so. And they had a curse pronounced upon them. Now how this might apply to Jesus, I'm not really certain. Because when Jesus hung upon the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So what was Jesus asking for? The justness of God. 
In the case and point of their repentance, then forgive them. But if they did not repent, then the wrath of God would be upon them. And again, that's why, you know, many times we talk about praying for our enemies. When we pray for our enemies, we need to pray that the justice of God will be served. And what that means is if our enemies repent and turn to God, he'll forgive them. And their souls will be saved. And if not, then they're going to be judged by God for the way that they have done. But now let's look at the last section. Concluding song of praise and assurance, picking up there in verse 29. So let's walk through here. Like I said, it doesn't end with just part of a description here of what's going on. Let's look at the, the whole part, portion. He says, but I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bull, which has horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad, and you who seek God, your heart shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not despise the prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. All right, now, let's back up there for just a moment to verse 29. Notice the way he, he starts this next section. The humility seen within the writer here. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, be set, set me up on high. And is that not what we seek when we turn to our Heavenly Father? We live here on this earth. We face the various trial, trials. And Peter reminds us that if Jesus was persecuted, we don't need to think it strange that we face persecution as well. But ultimately, in the despair that we face within the life that we live here on this earth, despair brought about by sin and so forth, we are looking to our Heavenly Father to lift us up on high, if you would, to exalt us in a manner of speaking. And the psalmist says, I will, I will praise the name of God with a song, and I and will magnify Him with thanksgiving. The psalmist knew who he needed to look to for salvation, and he would tell the world. You think about the idea of I will praise the name of God with song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This is not simply talking about the privacy of your own home, which could be very much so. But the psalmist at every opportunity would magnify the Lord before all with thanksgiving. And again, imagine this song being sung within a worship service unto God. And then verse 3, a couple more thoughts here and then the lesson will be yours. He says, this also shall please the Lord better than ox or bull. All right, now, does that phrase bring you back to thinking about Jesus a little bit? The Hebrew writer. The Hebrew writer tells us that it was not possible for what to take away the, man, the sin of man. Yeah, it wasn't possible for the blood of bulls and goats to save us from our sins. That took the blood of Jesus Christ. And so... Again, we, we see a hint, we see a glimmer here that, that when you look at the, the full life of Christ and his death and the teachings about Jesus, you can't help but think about him as you read through this psalm. Then he says there, The humble shall see this and be glad, and you who seek God, your heart shall be glad. We are thankful to the Lord that he sent Jesus to die upon the cross of Calvary to be the sacrifice for our sins. The humble shall be glad, and you who seek God, your heart shall live. Now, the way, how, did, how would this apply to David? David learned a good while back, go back to Psalms 51, that he learned with this sin with Bathsheba, that what the Lord truly wanted and desired wasn't really the sacrifices of animals, but it was a pure and contrite heart. It was service from within, the service from within, the faith from within, the, the, the service from the heart, yes, it yielded proper outward obedience. But the outward acts of obedience were meaningless if it did not come from a heart, a humble heart, a heart of obedience. The humble shall see this and be glad. 
You who seek God, your heart shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not despise his prisoners. And David would have intended himself with this statement right here. The Lord does not despise him. The Lord looks to those who are his. So as David said earlier, the writer here says, Let heaven and earth praise him. The seas and everything that moves in them. Let all of creation that God has made praise his name. And now we come back to what David was hoping for. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and possess it. But yet, with a little bit of glimmer, you look at this, and you see it looking toward the time of Christ. Jesus died upon the cross of Calvary. God raised him up from the dead, never to die again. On that day of Pentecost, after Jesus ascended up into heaven, the fulfillment of the statement that from, from Jerusalem would flow forth the words of the Lord. And we think about Hebrews chapter 12, the latter part, how we have come to the spiritual city of Jerusalem. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and possess it. The writer here looked to a very physical fulfillment of that promise, but there is a great spiritual fulfillment in this as well. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12 for a moment. And let's jump to verse 22. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, the Hebrew writer. And we'll, we, there's more that we could say, but let's start there in verse 22. The Hebrew writer reminds Christians, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. This was made possible by the death of Christ upon the cross of Calvary, by his suffering. So we have come to this mountain, we've come to the city, we've come to the heavenly Jerusalem, we've come to the innumerable company of angels, we've come to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. We've come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Yes, the author here believed and hoped that God would save Judah, would save Zion. But as we've seen so many statements there applying to the life of Christ, woven within the text, we cannot help but see the end result of the death of Christ, who was alone, who was treated in the worst way that man could be treated, and then lifted up on high for all to see. And then the last verse, verse 36, also the descendants of his servant shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. There was the promise that as long as the children of Israel would serve the Lord, the land would be theirs forever. And they failed in that because they rejected God. God found fault with them, the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 8. Therefore he brought into effect a new covenant. And that's a quote from Jeremiah 31 beginning in verse 31. And this new covenant brings now to the people of God a new land, a new city. We are now his holy nation, not a physical nation, but a spiritual nation, his own special possession, Peter tells us. And so we now become the descendants of those who serve the Lord faithfully, going back even to David, going back to Jacob, to Isaac, to Abraham, all the way back even to Seth and Abel. All those who have faithfully served the Lord, we are their descendants by faith. Paul makes that point very strong in Romans chapters uh, 4 and 5 about we being the descendants of Abraham by our faith in God. And those who love his name shall dwell in the land of inheritance is the point there. When it says, and those who love his name shall dwell in it, talking about that land of inheritance. And for the children of God who live and breathe today, we're looking forward this, to this time when we will spend eternity with God in heaven. Yes, our citizenship is in heaven. We know that, although we are still walking around on this earth. But the time will come where we will receive that forever promised land. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 makes a point about that. 
Since the first generation fell in the wilderness, there now remains a land of promise. And so David talks about it, says, while it is called today, encourages his generation to live faithful. But the Hebrew writer encourages us to live faithful because there is a land of promise that we are traveling to right now. If you're not a Christian, let me encourage you to spend some time reading some of the Psalms. It'll it'll bring questions to mind, and and you'll wonder about some things. But do a read-through and look at the trust that the psalmist placed in God. Look at the fact that they suffered hardships just like we do today. And look look at the times that the psalmist felt like it was all for nothing. And then he stopped and paused and realized God was always there. Take the time to look at what God has done for his people and then give us time to show you what he has done for you. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you're there and you're trying to decide about whether or not you should make the change, turning away from your life of sin to serving God, Let me encourage you, you need to do this today because your soul is at stake. If you believe that Christ is the Son of God, then be willing to make the confession of your faith and obey His command to be baptized. So you rise up then to walk in newness of life. This is the the repent and be converted that Peter talks about in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. You rise up out of the water grave of baptism to walk in the newness of life. Now, live that faithful life to the very final days upon this earth, and you'll spend eternity with God in heaven. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. Maybe the turbulence of the world has caused you to doubt. Maybe it has caused you to give up. It's time to come back to these Psalms and see that, yes, the Lord is always there watching His people. And it doesn't mean that we're going to have perfect days. It doesn't mean that we're never going to have any problems or challenges. But it does mean that no matter what we go through, we can endure it and our soul is always and forever protected by our Heavenly Father. If we'll serve Him faithfully and if we stray from His fellowship, if we'll repent and come back, then we'll spend eternity with Him in heaven. Learn from the faith of the psalmist and walk with that same faith today. If you're subject to the gospel's call and invitation, come forward now as we stand and as we sing.